We're here at uh, Lane Place. This is uh, the 14th of May, 1991. This is a series of interviews being done of Montgomery County men and women who served during World War II. And as you know, uh, Ken, we're, this is the 50th anniversary and the Historical Society, Montgomery County Historical Society, working with the American Legion and the uh, veterans of foreign wars are doing these interviews to bring out the experiences of, of local people uh, during the war. Uh, the uh, genesis of this thing really was uh, that public television series you saw on the Civil War mm -hmm. last uh, last fall where those those old fellows from Gettysburg were gathered around there with all those white beards and trading yes. stories about, about their experiences there. Uh, these so uh, what we intend, these are going to be the property of the Montgomery County yes, Historical Society, and the way we're going to do it is we're going to put uh, a couple of copies of each of these interviews over in the Carpenterville Public Library, and we're going to give a copy to you for your own family. Yeah, and uh, we hope that uh, well, maybe a hundred years from now they'll be looking at the, <laughs> the experiences of. Kenneth Davidson back when he was uh, in the uh, in the service in World War World War II. Uh, so I think what I'll do is I'll start out by just uh, uh, give us your full name. Kenneth Eugene Davidson. And uh, where were you born? I was when? born. I was born July the sixth, nineteen twenty-three. In that little town of Byron, Indiana, where I was born. That's down in uh, Park County. Park County. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Uh, down along there used to be a railroad there, didn't there? Or, or, no, I can't tell you yeah. about that. Okay. Uh, and uh, that's pretty rural out there. Yeah, it is. And where did you go to school? I went to school at Walls, 12 years, graduated at Walls High School. Mm -hmm. Are you uh, related to any of the Davidsons no. around Montgomery County? No, none of these are any of my relation here. Uh, All right, there, of course, you you knew there was Kenneth well, yeah, yeah, Davidson yeah. here. They got me mixed up with him when I moved, first moved to Crawford. The, they run a a greenhouse down yeah. at Whitesville. Uh, now, uh, you went to uh, high school at Wallace, and was your uh, who were your parents? Samuel and and uh, Marguerite Davis. Uh huh. And uh, were they farmers? Yeah. Uh -huh. Okay. And uh, when you were got out of high school, did you go to work on the farm, or what did you do? Well, I worked. We had a small farm there, and I worked on it. And then I also done some work for a man doing some construction work down there before I went into the service. Yeah. And uh, when did the uh, draft start breathing down your neck? Oh, late '42, somewhere. I tried to volunteer, but my grandmother wouldn't let me. I was living with my grandmother. My brother had already gone. She didn't want me to go, and I wanted to volunteer, and she wouldn't let me. She had to sign the papers, of course. And, and, uh, Were your parents uh, My see? dad and mother had separated, and, and my dad lived over in Indianapolis, so my brother and I were raised by my grandparents. My uh -huh. grandfather died in early 42, and then my brother went into the Air Force in late 42. What was uh, what were your grandparents' names? Howard and, and Mary Davidson. They were on your father's side there? Yes. Uh -huh. All right. Uh, and. Uh, so what were you doing when did you, you got a draft notice there somewhere along the line? Yeah, sure did. You were single at that time? Yes, I was. And uh, you were highly eligible? Oh, yes. Yes, I was. And uh, did you, uh, uh, when did you get your draft notice? Oh, let's see, it had to be in February, sometime in February of 43. When did you go in the service? It was in March, early March, I'm not sure. I think, I would say around the 3rd of March when I, in 43. 43. How did they have to wait that long on you? I, I don't know. Were you, uh, uh, were you uh, in the draft, uh, with the draft board down there in Putnam mm -hmm. County? Is that oh, no, it was Fountain County. See, Walsh was in Fountain County. Oh, yeah, County. Fountain County. Okay. And uh, when did you report for duty? We, we, the 10th of March, we went to Fort Benjamin and Harrison. We mm -hmm. spent, oh, a few days there, I'm not sure how long. Uh -huh. And then went to Fort Stewart, Georgia. I can tell you in my records what the date was we arrived when we were activated. Oh, uh, Fort Stewart, what, uh, 
It was Camp Street then. Yeah. It was a temporary fort, and it's now Fort Stewart, where the 24th Division went out up to Saudi Arabia yeah. recently. Now, what, were you, what branch of the service it was, was in the artillery, Coast Artillery is what it was called, although we were a machine gun battery, heavy yeah. machine gun battery. And uh, you got your basic down there at Stewart? Yes, uh -huh. from March until October. March until October, that was a pretty long uh, basic training. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, we, we went overseas in October. Oh, I see. All right, you were at uh, Camp Stewart, and uh, what, do uh, you have any recollections? Did you have anything unusual happen there at Stewart? Oh, uh, not too much. I can remember we would go out, uh, we would go out on the firing range at the time and set our machine guns up out there, and they would have a tow plane, tow a target, you know, on a cable. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was a non-com by then, and uh, it was my duty to stand you, You'd been... Uh, I was a corporal. corporal. And I, they would have one of us standing behind the the, gun, the man that was gunning, using the gun, firing on the target. And I remember that you had to be careful, because sometimes if the plane would come in, they had stakes out on each side, and you're supposed to start firing at the target when it came inside this stake. And when it got over here, you're supposed to see Stop. <laughs> you sometimes they'd fire at the plane when the plane got in there before, <laughs> before the target got in there. Yeah. And, uh, well, how how come you were a non-com uh, just uh, in basic? Were you? Uh, you well, uh, it was a brand new outfit, and uh, you made corporal while you were in basic. Just shortly, yeah. You know, it was March, May, May. I made corporal. Uh, were you as skinny then as you are now? Yeah. Uh, what did you What did you weigh when you went in the service? Oh, about 150. Uh huh. And uh, how tall are you? I'm a little over six foot. Uh, well, did, you never did hit one of those. They never did hit one of those. No, no, thank God they didn't. No. <laughs> I suppose it has that. If you had to knock them off the gun, sometimes they'd freeze on the gun once in a while. Uh -huh. They might have it parting straight up in the air. Some of those city boys out of New York places were, they hadn't been around any guns, you know. Yeah. They, would, they would get all upset. All right, now uh, where did you go from Stewart? We went left there in, uh, I'm not sure what the date is, uh, in October and we went to Camp Patrick Henry in Virginia. Mm -hmm. We got processed there, got all the shots, and I don't know how many days we spent there, and then we left there, we pulled out of there on the 20th, well we boarded the boats in Newport News, Virginia on the 23rd of October. Of 1943. 43. Uh, were you assigned to an outfit by that time? We we was we formed a brand new outfit. Did yeah, you? yeah. We our outfit was brand new. It was formed. What was the name of the outfit? Our outfit, machine gun battery, was six forty four triple A machine gun, anti aircraft artillery machine gun battery, uh -huh. and it was in the eighteenth airborne battalion. There was four batteries formed the eighteenth airborne. And uh, was that part of a division? It was part of a group, uh -huh. eighty seven triple A group. And who was your commanding officer? My commanding officer was Captain William G. Day. And uh, he he was in command of the battalion. No, the battery. battery. Yeah. Battery. Okay. Uh, all right. Uh, have any recollections of your uh, emb embarkation and uh, your trip across the ocean? Yes, I. Tell I us remember about we that. got on the boat. They they put us on the boat in the oh in the middle of the afternoon, I'd say. We got on and finally loaded, and they pulled out in the harbor, and then they dropped anchor. And we stayed there till overnight, and then we pulled out the next morning out in the Atlantic. And uh, I can remember when we got out, it had to be a huge convoy because, as far as you can see, in all directions, nothing but ships. Mm -hmm. And we spent. Uh, Do you have any destroyers? Uh, yeah, that you saw? destroyers and, ex and destroyer escorts and some of those little. I don't know what they were small. Boats of some kind bobbing around. Looked like corks bobbing around out in there. Yeah, they had, and we had a few uh, submarines apparently uh, got into the convoy, but we never, uh, I saw them, we saw them dropping depth charges and stuff like that, but they never, uh, they never hit us. And another thing I remember one morning, uh, when you're down in the hole, it was pretty smelly down there. Okay. Uh, all in what kind of a ship were you on? It was a Liberty ship. Uh -huh. And I can't remember, it was U.S. Uh, Ship, but I can't remember the name of it. But my first thing in the morning was to get up and get up on deck to get some fresh air. I never got seasick like some of them did, but it was a foul smell down in that hole. Yeah. I'd get up on deck and get some fresh air, 
before we had breakfast. And I was standing up there on the left side of the boat one morning, and they were always, the boats were changing position all the time. Yeah. And the boat owner made it left. He was off our way, started moving up. And all of a sudden, he just turned, and he, he just ran square into this boat on the other side of it, just for wham. You mean he hit him? Yeah, knocked a big hole. They said it was big enough to drive a two-and-a-half-ton truck to it. And they dropped back, and we went on, and they said he got in. He went in, and we went on through the revolver about two, three days later, and they said that boat got in about three days after we Yeah, I hit him. Lord daylight. But the ship stayed up even with that hole in it. Well, it, no, it dropped out of the convoy, but the other oh. one did. But did it sink? No, it didn't sink. They were able to, they were able to repair oh. it enough. It had to drop out. It couldn't keep yeah. up with the rest. Tell us of about your quarters on the, on the ship. Well, they were down in the holes, and they were like hammocks. And I don't know how high they were. They were very close together. Mm -hmm. And you just had to kind of slide in sideways to... Uh, you could fill it with this. You could uh, feel the other fellow's breath yeah, when you slept yeah, at night? Yeah. Okay. And if you, you tried to get up as high as you could because if somebody was seasick, buddy, you didn't want him uh -huh. coming down. A lot of them did get seasick. And I, you know, I never, I never had that happen to me. Well, what about, uh, what about the sanitation conditions on the ship? Well, they had the heads there, as they called them, and they were uh, Pretty well. well. They weren't that bad, but their showers now was salt water showers, yeah. and you couldn't. Uh, well, I always remember that. Oh, uh, you couldn't get that. You couldn't get that salt off. Uh, uh, no, you couldn't. I remember. It wouldn't, that. The soap wouldn't work. No, it uh, just wouldn't work with that yeah. salt water. Uh -uh. And uh, oh, I suppose with that many troops, it wasn't that bad. Or the trim. Yeah. Oh, they called them heads, I guess. Yeah. So. And uh, during the daytime, were you able to? get up on the deck and just lie around. Yeah, if you could. Crab games going on. Yeah, and it was the crowd. Fire games and all yeah, that stuff. Right, right, right. Find some shade under a lifeboat, something Try like to, that. Yeah. Uh, uh -huh. And uh, what about the food and the, the mess conditions? It wasn't very good. Uh, we only got fed two times. Yeah. And uh, they claimed that was, they, they claimed later that they didn't get the rations on the boat, but I think it was just planned that way. That it was, most of it was heated. It was canned, like uh, potatoes and something in there, and they would throw that in a big uh, vat of hot water and warm it up. And if you're lucky, you got one that warmed all the way through. If you didn't, well, it was cold in the middle. It wasn't, it wasn't very good. Uh, uh, did you eat out of off your mess kits, or did you uh, just eat it out of the can? So. Uh -huh. uh, and uh, okay, you remember going through the stretch of the brawler? Yeah, I remember going through there, you know, uh, it's pretty vague now, but uh, they told us we were going through there and you could uh -huh. see the rocks and stuff. You could see the rocks. Uh -huh. And you uh, went over there to Oran yeah, we put, in, we uh, in an, uh, Algeria. Yes. Uh -huh. uh, did you uh, go ashore in Algeria? Oh yeah, we spent two months there. We, and uh, what, uh, were you just marking time or did they have some assignment for you? Well, uh, we, we were outside, they took us outside about 15 miles east of Oran, and uh, there was tent cities all over there, you know, mm -hmm. where they had troops, and we thought we were going into Italy. And uh, yeah, they would take us uh, out on a hike just to be... Just to exercise. Yeah, yeah, because we were just sitting there waiting. We thought we were, like I said, I thought we thought we were going to Italy. Was it pretty hot? No, this was, uh, this was in January. Oh. Uh, yeah, January, oh, we landed there in... Uh, November, 12th of November, and we stayed here on January the 11th, and it was cold and rainy, oh. and uh, miserable. It was muddy. And, uh, Did you sleep on the ground, or they had cots? We had cots in our tents, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. How about the uh, eating conditions? The food was, was real good there. We had good cooks, and, and they were able to uh, have us good, uh, good meals there, yeah. What kind of tents were those? Were those uh, well, just a six-man tent, the little square ones, you know, that uh -huh. uh, you could get six men in one of them. Yeah. Now, had your outfit uh, begun to be pretty much buddies by this time? Did yeah. You get yeah. Uh, yeah, I, you know, we were, uh, I often said, I, I don't know whether there's been any better out there. We just got along, most of it. There was a few fellows that were involved, but 
I always said that we got along real good. I always thought that, and I and they're still good friends today. The ones still there, we've been uh, living together. Do you, do you, were you uh, still a corporal by this time? Yeah, I never got any higher than that. Is that crazy. right? <laughs> Uh, probably just didn't have any place in the table organization for it. No. For anything. All right. Well, uh, did you have your weapons aboard the ship? No. Or you uh, were just your own personal weapons. We did. But our our machine guns and all that stuff was packed in Georgia, and they went and they went with an officer and a, three or four enlisted men went to the west coast, and they went around the the other way. I often thought they didn't want to lose both of us, the guns and the, yeah. and the men, but they. They came after. They didn't even get there like we did in India. Uh, but they went the other way. Did, uh, uh, did you, you spoke of a personal weapon. What weapon did you have? Well, I had a, like I say, I was a squad there. I had a six-man squad. Yeah. We had the 50 caliber machine gun. Two of my men had Grand rifles, and the rest of us had Thompson subs. But that was your personal weapon? Yes. That and was you was carried good. those with you yes, overseas? Yes, you did. Okay. Well, now, uh, We've got you over in Iran and uh, in Tent City there, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, you say it was about January. You found out that uh, you were going to move. Yeah. Move on from there. Yes, it was. Uh, how did they break the news to you? What did they? Well, we got the news, but well, they, they just told us we'd pack up and we were going to leave, and we were supposed to leave one day, and they had to cancel it for some reason, and we we had to uh, wait until the next day. But uh, I don't remember. They just called us out in formation, I suppose, and said, uh -huh. we're going to move on. While you were at Oran, did you see any uh, trace of the enemy? Uh, no, see, they were all out of there by then. Yeah, yeah but so I thought maybe some airplanes or something. You know? No, the only time was when we left the harbor pulling out of there, there was a Japanese torpedo plane came across. And, uh, Not a Japanese. I mean a, a German, I'm sorry. German. Yeah, a German. And uh, we pulled out. There was We was on a British ship. HMS Aranda, I remember that name. Aranda? Aranda. Aranda. HMS Aranda was the name of it. A R O N D A? Yeah. Okay. But there was a French ship pulling out. It was loaded with troops also. Pulled out of the harbor ahead of us and missed Japanese. Uh, we were up on, or German. We were up on the upper deck and we pulling out because our unit, man, they had 20 millimeter uh, anti aircraft guns on this pretty ship and we, we were the man, and did man those on the way over because we were familiar with them. We were up on the deck and getting our instructions and everything, and I saw a plane coming in, and he dropped his torpedo. He didn't hit anything, but now he had to know when that those boats were. He'd come from Crete or someplace, but uh -huh. uh, had to know that that they still had uh, They still had air bases over in Crete at that time. Yeah, they did. Uh -huh. Well, uh, but uh, they didn't... Uh, you saw the German plane, but nothing happened. No, he, his torpedo missed. Uh huh. And uh, where did you where did you go from there? We went through the Mediterranean and then down through the Suez Canal uh -huh. and across the. Uh, what are your recollections of the Suez Canal? It wasn't any way near what I thought it would be. You know, uh -huh. it was just seemed like stretches of, of just a big canal running down through there, and it was desert on both sides. And I remember being real cold. Uh, we'd be up there, and it was February, Jan late January. It's pretty cold. Mm -hmm. It was surprising. Yeah. I didn't expect that. What kind of clothing were uh, did, were you still wearing the same clothing you started out with? Yeah, we went out, and I always made me. We went out with the wool ODs, which we needed at that time. We mm -hmm. had the wool overcoats. Uh, of course, when we got to India, we didn't need those at all. Yeah. And where did you go from the Suez Canal down through the Red Sea? Yeah, and. Uh, we stopped at, uh, it was Aden, the Gulf of Aden, and it was a city, the port of Aden. Yes. And they fuel, I remember fueling up the boat, and it, it was a coal burning uh, boat, fueled by coal, and they, I remember seeing those, they brought out boats loaded with sacks of coal, in burlap sacks, and they had two planks running up to the door, doors on in the side of the boat, and those natives was carrying those on their, Backs. Mm -hmm. and there was line going up with, and line coming out just to stay. That's the way they loaded that coal. Uh -huh. And hot, oh, it was hot there in, yeah. uh, in that port. Those well, natives could take it though. Well, they were used to it. Yeah. Know? And then we went on into and ported to Bombay. Now, this was a British ship. How did those uh, conditions compare with the American ship? Terrible. 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 
I've always heard I've always heard of the British Navy, you know, and, and I, it was it was terrible. They had our our food there was a, a morning was a, like a like a cream wheat cereal or something like that, and, and that meal was full of bugs. You had to pick the bugs out of it so you wouldn't be eating them. And the bread that they had was made out of the same meal of them because it was full of bugs. Good. And I got a spell of runs from both ends one night from some of that stuff I was eating. And I went through a spell of that. But, uh, the British ship was, in my opinion, filthy uh -huh. compared to our own. Oh, uh, was it the Indian crew? Yeah, mostly Indian. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, did you were, were there uh, medical facilities there when you got the uh, trot so that they could yeah they and took they, care of it they did our own medics took care of me mostly uh -huh. we had our own medics uh, did uh, what about the sleeping quarters were there still hammocks were they uh, you could sleep up on deck on that one if you could find room and that's where mm -hmm. we usually spent the night yep. and they would, those Indians would come around and to, Wash the deck, washy deck, they'd say, and try to get you up the next morning. We'd sleep up on top, it was so hot, you know. Uh -huh. We'd just throw a blanket down up on the deck and lay up there. Mm -hmm. All right, uh, your ne what was your next stop after Aden? Bombay. Uh, you got off the ship at Bombay? We got off the ship at Bombay, but just about daylight that morning. I'm not sure what the day was in February. Do you remember the name of the ship that uh, you, know, you said a run? Yeah, yeah, it was yes. Okay, I was trying to think of the ship that I was on. Oh, oh, yeah. I, I, I cannot remember the one who went across from the Newport News to Iran. It was, it, it was a good yeah. ship. I can't remember that. Okay. But I don't know why that one sticks out. Because it was so filthy, I suppose, that it sticks yeah. in my mind. Okay, and when did you land in Bombay? Oh, that was about February. Uh, 40, 44, four. early February. What are your recollections of Bombay? Well, I didn't see a whole lot of it that time because we got off the ship, walked up the gangplank, and uh, it was, like I say, it was just getting daylight. And we walked right up, and there was a, ra a train, a rail station there. And we were, they told us we'd be boarding the plane, or the train, about, you know, uh, in a couple hours. Well, we laid around that till 4 o'clock in the afternoon before that train ever got there. And oh. it got extremely hot. And that's all I saw in Bombay. It was just the edge of it there. Yeah. Well, yeah. that what was that train like? <laughs> <laughs> it was a narrow gauge train uh, with little small individual cars. You couldn't go. You couldn't walk from one car to another. It was just there yeah. wasn't any. And they had wood. They had wood slatted seats. Yeah. And uh, we went out about uh, 90 miles out, I think, out to a, a British camp called Diwali, and we spent a couple of three days there and then got on another train just like that and went, went across the India to Calcutta and that was, it seemed like it took forever. Um, yeah, across, went across the, uh, yeah. stayed all across India. Yeah, that was all yeah. India at that time. It's yeah. broken up into three countries now. Yeah, and uh, no travel facilities on, no. The, on the train. They'd stop ever so often just like, you know, and, and just seemed like for no reason they'd stop out in the middle of the country and stop, you know. You would hop out? And, yeah. Uh -huh. And uh, remember going through those little towns there? And oh, so yeah. On? I remember the beggars and stuff. And, uh -huh. and uh, I remember the, the food we had on there was canned corned beef. It was British supplies. It was yeah. canned corned beef and bread. And the bread was unwrapped. It was just, it didn't have any wrapping on it. And it was stacked up in racks over the seats up over the head. We had that across India. By the time we got across India, it was pretty near black, because you can imagine all that stuff coming in. And, uh, that was our ration across, going across. Uh -huh. Corned beef. What salmon. about water? It must have been, uh, did you have, but it must have supplied you with water. Yeah, you kind of and I can't remember. Yeah, well, yeah, we had water, but I can't remember how they did that. But we did have water, yeah. Because you certainly couldn't drink the water on no, the no, 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 uh -huh. All right, you got over to Calcutta, then what happened? We got on another train station there in Calcutta and went north and we went as far as you could go. The, the, the railway ran up to a river bank and that was the end. Was it an arrow gauge railroad? Yeah. Right yeah. Down. And we got off and uh, then we had to wait there was a river boat came down. We had to wait quite some time and uh, I remember one thing I remember we were sitting there at lunchtime we were having a corned beef sandwich and we were set up on there was a high bank looking down on the I'm not sure whether it was the Ganges or whatever river it was. 
That's the first time that we saw a body come floating by, you know. And I found out that was un not unusual over there, you know, but it was to us. Mm -hmm. And then finally, a boat came in down there, and we carried everything down, and we got on the boat. What did you carry over? What, what do you mean you carried oh, over? Oh, we had some boxes and stuff with us and everything. And, uh, uh -huh. uh, we had to lug it down the hill and get on the boat. And then we found out we were on the wrong boat. We said, well, we got to get off. It's the wrong boat. So we had to carry it back <laughs> up the hill. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like the usual <laughs> army stuff. <laughs> and finally, the right one came in, and, and, and we went up the river then, and we got off at another place. And, and you don't know what that river was? Uh, I can tell you by looking at that map, but I'm uh -huh. not sure. I think it's the Ganges but I'm not real sure. Um, but we got off at this other uh, port, and uh, they had trucks there, GI trucks there. So Was your outfit still sticking together? Oh, yeah. Uh, uh, how many men in the Europe? Well, see, there's only 85 men and five officers all there was in our battery. Yeah, but uh, just this one battery was moving up? No, there was there was, uh, there was two batteries already there. They had come already over, and there was another battery with us. There was two batteries of 85 men and five officers traveling with us. Mm -hmm. There were two batteries that I'd come over there earlier, and they were already there. Yeah. What did you think of your officers? Basically pretty good. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, Captain Day was a pretty GI, but he was an honest. I mean, he, he, he treated everybody the same. I mean, mm -hmm. and he, he, didn't, uh, he expected you to do your job. Mm -hmm. and, uh, if you didn't, why well, you heard about it, but uh, he was fair with everybody. And I, well was he a professional soldier? Yeah. Uh -huh. our, all our, uh, well, the carrier that trained us in Georgia had been the regular army. And they, uh -huh. they trained us and they went overseas with us then. They had the choice of training some more or going overseas and I think they decided that they couldn't put up with any more recruits like that so they didn't want to overseas. Yeah. <laughs> uh, did, uh, was this fellow a West Pointer by any chance? No, he wasn't, but he career man. Uh -huh. And uh, what about the other officers? Well, there was, uh, we, uh, I forgot to tell you, we lost an officer in Oran. Uh, in fact, he was my platoon officer, uh, Lieutenant Hesman. And he, over we were on, in, uh, over in Oran, he had met a French whack in, Al in uh, Algiers. And he had flown over there to see her. And we got our orders to leave, and he hadn't come back, and the old man had kind of covered for him. And he hadn't come back, and they got the one in the, a plane had hit, there was a mountain on the on the Mediterranean there, Lion Mountain, and there had been a plane crash there, and they went down, and he had been on that plane that crashed, and they didn't even know he died in that crash. He was killed. And he was killed on New, uh, Christmas Eve, I find in my records, when he was killed. Uh -huh. So when we got over there, I got a, my uh, platoon officer was Lieutenant Riley. He lives in Independence, Missouri right now. Uh, just a young man, and he was a nice man, and Captain Day, and Ken Scott was a red-headed boy out of North Carolina. He was the best bike officer of all of them. He was just not, in fact, he got killed in Burma. But he was the best of all of them. Mm -hmm. But most of them were good officers. And he had three platoon officers, an executive officer, and, and a battery yeah. commander. Okay, you got on board this uh, boat and went up the river. And then we, they got, they brought trucks, they had trucks there, and had two and a half ton trucks, and they hauled us to this airfield. North of Dhaka, which is in now in Bangladesh, uh -huh. uh, the airstrip of North. In fact, it's the Dhaka International Airport right now. Uh -huh. And that was where you were stationed. We were there for they put they set us up around there. We that was in February, and they had a, we were around that air airstrip. Uh, Twelve machine gun squad. We were scattered all the way around. And we lived in bamboo bashes, they call them. Six man squad. We stayed. We were spotted all the way around the, the air base. And of course. We were 500 miles from any, any enemy at that time, and it got pretty dull there, you know. Yeah. No Japanese around No, all? no. They, they wouldn't even been any plane been able to got there with all the air cover we had, you know. Uh -huh. no, we stayed there. It was pretty dull, like I say, for from, from Well, how long did you stay there? We stayed till, uh, no, yeah, November. That's when we flew out there in gliders in November. Oh, this would have been November of what? 44. 44. Uh, but you stayed at this one yeah, airport. Yeah, was the airport. Yeah. And how were living conditions there? They were very good there. Good. I mean, we had, you know, like we lived in six-man squads around there, and we had the, we had a little Indian boy, each one of us had a little Indian boy that came on the K-1 
came over every day and we paid him to uh, clean our uh, wash your clothes and clean our everything. And, mm -hmm. and, uh, we had a mess at our headquarters. We all grouped over there and they would uh, pick us up for chow. They would come around with the truck and they'd pick up half the squad for the first run and then the second half would go yeah. uh, the second run. And they, and they had real good chow. We had some good mess sergeants. Was it over. American food or British food? It was a little of both. I mean, oh. they used some British stuff, and uh, they used uh, fruit that they could use over there, like bananas. You couldn't use the stuff. They used human fertilizer over there, fertilized yeah. stuff, and you had to, some of that stuff growing ground you couldn't eat. Yeah. Uh, but our mess was very good for What did you do for recreation when you were sitting around there doing? Well, we had, you know, we had a softball team, and we had basketball teams, and, and we'd done that even in the heat of the day, you know, and then we'd we would go out and fire, they'd, they'd get a uh, plane to tow a sleeve and we'd go out and fire on that, you know. It was pretty dull, I'd tell you, sitting there, you know. Yeah. What about the nights? What would you do at night? Well, they could... Go to bed? Well, now DACA was not too far away and, and they would take a truck into DACA and there was, you know, there was movies in there and they had movies on the base and stuff like uh -huh. that. And I was telling them a while ago there was a, there was a B-25 uh, squadron based on there. Uh, Billy Mitchell was a two-engine bomb. And when we were, at this time, the, the Japanese had all of Burma and were in India, in fact, up in the infall probably. And they were flying, uh, they weren't flying bomber missions, they were flying British artillery ammo in the infall, the city of infall, to the, for the British Army. And they were, uh, they had plenty of pilots, but their crew members were getting exhausted as many hours they were flying. And, and of course, they were, the B-25s were equipped with 50 caliber machine guns, is what we had. And the uh, commanding officer asked Captain Day if we would, if any of our men would want to volunteer to fly as gunners on those artillery flights. And of course, everybody wanted to go and just get in and do something, you know. So we would fly out. Uh, they had me in the waste gunner, and we'd fly out early in the morning. So you, you mean you, know, you switched over to, to flying? Well, we just done this temporary, see. Yeah. And it's probably one of the only times that uh, Army ground troops. Uh, flew his gunners on Air Force planes. See, it, you know, it do not happen very often. Yeah. But the, we flew out of this base, we were on over to another British base early in the morning, and they fueled the plane and put the artillery ammo in. And then we flew into Infall, and they were, they were well, shelling the Infall. You flew into where, did you say? It's the province of Infall. It's up in the northeastern part of India. How Japanese do you spell people. that, do you know? I-M-P-H-A-L. Info. And the okay. city, the capital city is Info. And that's where we flew into the airport there. And they were shelling the, the Japanese were shelling the strip there. Because I remember when we landed, they whisked us off in a jeep into the basement of the terminal there. And then they fed us. And they unloaded the ammo and refueled the plane. And they whisked us back out. And we went back and got another load. <clears throat> and came and hauled two loads a day in there and then back to your home base. So we got that several days. Uh -huh. and, uh, that gave us a little something. To Right time. All right. Uh, how many of those missions did you go on? I went on probably six, and the, the other guys went on probably that many. You know, they only take it only take one guy of our outfit on the plane in the crew. They just drop one of their crew members off and put one of ours in there. Well, uh, where where were you positioned on the plane? I was in the waist gun. I was tall. Now a couple of little guys went back into the crawl back into the tail turret back there uh -huh. and run that, but I was too tall to get back in there. I, ha I handled two waste guns in the middle of the plane. No, waste guns are on the... Right in the middle of the plane, behind your, your wings, and there's a gun in each side of that there. Mm -hmm. And uh, I manned both of them. Did you have to use them at no, all? we only oh. saw two or three planes off of the distance, and uh, I'd yeah. report them when I'd see one, you know. But we had the British and the Air U.S. Air Force had pretty good air cover over there. They they came out once in a while, but mostly at night when they came. They afraid to they afraid to sneak in there too much. Yeah. Okay, well, what happened then? Well, uh, in November, why like, we got orders to fly out there and, and they was uh, the British forty November of what? Of forty four. Four. Okay. The British was wanting to build up an airstrip in Burma and they wanted to set up some perimeter defense, and so they, the British went in first, and paratroopers went in first, and then we followed them in in gliders. They dropped us in there in gliders, and this, it was a small valley down there with a, a 
fairly decent field in there, the rice paddies. We went in and we set up around the... Had you ever been in a glider before? <laughs> no. We trained for that, but we'd never, we'd been in planes, but we'd never been in a glider. What does that feel like? That, uh, uh, you were towed behind another yeah. plane and then dropped in. Yeah, we loaded up there on that air base in, in Kermitola, India, and we put her, our, we put two 50 cal machine guns and all the equipment go with them and the ammo in there. In the glider. And we tied it, we had to lice it down to hold it. And then they, you sat down and they got, you got a pilot and a co pilot on the glider. And we they, they fasten the cable on and you start you go down the runway and, and the, the, the glider is there going first. And then the plane comes up. And then they flew it about five hundred miles and, and uh, the field where we were landing, we were flying over a ridge of hills going south. And he cut us loose about the time we were in the middle of that field going south. And we went down and circled and come in from the south. And uh, when you hit the ground that's got runners. The nose of that's got runners up over. It's got wheels. It's got landing gear, but it's got also got runners that runs up over the nose. But when you hit the ground, you're running it. I think they told us 90 miles an hour when you hit the ground. But that thing, momentum carries it. the tail phases up, and she kind of rolls along on them runners for a ways, and then the momentum finally just drops it right. down. And yeah, and they were snatching those sliders out after we after we unloaded. Uh, they would load them and pull them on up, and they had they would set two big poles up, and they would uh, they move that glider up and load it. They load them wounded. They were British wounded. Wounded. And they set this cable. This, this big nylon cable made up of thousands of nylon threads, and it came out and it had a loop on the end of it. And they would, that loop would go up over those poles, and this plane would come around with a C forty seven, and it had a it had a cable with a hook on it, and it had a reel. It had a reel in that plane, and they'd come down, and they'd come right down, and they sometimes they wouldn't hook it. They'd come down, and they'd hook that, and then that thing would. You could see that nylon cable stretching, and directly this thing would go and it would go up in the air, and they pulled, they snatched him out of there. And there were British wounded on board. Yeah, that. and uh, they told us. I think he, they said they were. They, Run at 120 mile an hour when you hooked on or something like that, and he told how he told us how much it slowed him down when that took a hold. It's that reel. It had a reel in there would let that slip some. Yeah, pay out. So yeah. Sort of now one of them crashed. It just got airborne and, and the cable snapped. Did you see it crash? Yeah, and it was full. Of, uh, I believe they were African. See, the British had the besides the British, they had uh, African troops. British, you know, they were in the British Army. Yeah. And they had Indians, of course. These, I believe, was Africans that they in that. I imagine they all died. Well, they were already wounded to start with. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, but they snapped those lighters out of there. Uh, well, now uh, you you were at this base now. Uh, uh, were there Japanese around it? Yeah, we set up around. The, there were British troops in there too. And we set up around the strip, and uh, in fact, there was a British forty millimeter right over close to me there, and. Uh, we were in there. I just took two men. They just took for each uh, machine gun. They took two squad members in the first plane. Now some of them were in. Some of our troops were in the in the plane, the tow plane. And then they had to, after they dropped us, they went on to another base and landed. And then they went to snatch these gliders out by another plane. Then they came in later. See, when we went in, I myself and one man, one of my squad was in there, and uh, they tore up several of the gliders. And it was a couple of days before the rest of our outfit got in there, and our mess never got in there. And there we were, we had, we had a uh, gun dug in there, and we slept. We just slept in the gun pit because there were just two of us. And we tried to sleep. On the glider or what? No, on, on, the, on the ground. On the ground. Was set up, see. Yeah. And, uh, there's two of us, so we, we just stayed there most of the time. This was in the winter, though. No, this well, it was in the winter, but it was hot. It was hot, okay, yeah. down there in the yeah. heat. Yeah, it would cool down at night, but it was terrifically hot in the daytime. We didn't have any food, and uh, there was this British quarter millimeter out over here, over behind us, and I went over and talked to their sergeant, and uh, he gave us, they gave us food, you know, to eat until mm -hmm. our, until our outfit, the rest of the outfit got in there. So my one squad member and I spent a couple of days and nights practically in that gun pit sleeping there, you know, 
Well, they would infiltrate once in a while, or night especially. Now you talk about a gun pit. What? Uh, well, describe like, that. It's just we just dug just a big hole in the ground, and you dig it down so your gun will, and you mount the dirt up around here, and you just dig it in long enough that you can shoot mm -hmm. on the ground and we'll fly in airplanes too see they whenever they came over with any time they came over a plane they came down at treetop level they didn't come in they didn't come in at high altitude yeah they come in. the japs you mean yeah how far away were the japanese their well, air bases well their air bases are a long ways what they would do would they would occur down in the old thailand or someplace but what they would do is they would fly up to some base that they controlled they, they didn't want to leave the planes up too close to where our Air Force or the British Air Force could get to them. They would fly, when they were getting ready to make a raid, they would fly their planes into a base somewhere there in Burma, within range of where they wanted to go, mm -hmm. fuel them up, and then fly their mission, and then they would fly back to that base and fuel up, and then take them on back out of range of the... Because yeah. the British Air Force and the Royal Air Force and the U.S. Air Force, basically in the daytime, they control the skies over there, you know. Mm -hmm. they didn't most of the time it was night stuff when they came. Now did, uh, did you, uh, were you, did you ever have to, did, did you use your uh, machine gun? Oh, yeah, yeah, air, air and, and ground both, yeah. And uh, how many times did you have to go through that? Oh, uh, the air wasn't that much. I'd say uh, eight or ten nights is all I can remember. I, uh, yeah. I remember one night that we were sitting, my gun was on a, they had me on a ridge, point of a ridge that came out. It was kind of a roaded area there, and the airstrip was down here. There was a small airstrip here and a large airstrip on over, and, and my gun was on this ridge. And we were uh, under uh, British orders to not fire until they, their radar let us inform us that there was enemy planes, and there was a red alert on that. But we were sitting there one night, and there was planes landing on the large airstrip over there, uh, our planes, and uh, we were sitting there, and uh, we you'd get used to listening to hear the air, different aircraft, and you could tell the sound of them. They've got different sound. We were sitting there, and we were, that's a plane was flying around and said, that's not, that's not one of our planes. And he went down that other airstrip, and he unloaded uh, a whole load of bombs and a British, there was a British uh, fighter unit over there mm -hmm. and they had their planes in a covered up there and they dropped the big bombs on them and he went on south and then he came back and he came back over to the small airstrip where we were and we opened up on him and then he dropped his anti-personnel bombs on on the, the little airstrip down there and uh, we opened up on him uh, we didn't get him but we opened up on him there. but uh, we never did get him was this at night yeah it was at night Mm -hmm. uh, now, uh, you say that uh, you're talking about uh, air attacks. You had, uh, were there Japanese around there? Yeah, yeah. Infiltrating and yeah. trying to get in? Yeah. Tell us about they that. They would do that at night. Uh, they would slip in. They, what, one of their favorite tricks was they called them jitter parties over there. They would slip in. They called them what? Jitter parties, what they call them. Jitter. Jitter parties. Okay. Uh, they would slip into a area where there was a bunch of troops, British or whatever, and they would throw their own grenades, just toss them out, and, and mass confusion of what they'd try to, to uh, create, you know. Mm -hmm. And sometimes you'd, you'd be firing one another, maybe, you know, when they when yep. they flip in there. And that's about all we had up until we went into that uh, McTeela. That's where we where we got into the worst of it. Mm -hmm. Well, now I take it then you moved on from where? We moved, yeah. See, we, we would stay just a short time, and we were, they would move us on to an advanced air base, is what we would do. Uh -huh. We would move on up. We moved sometimes by air, and sometimes if it wasn't too far, we'd move by convoy. But uh, we would move fairly frequently, yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, how long were you at this place then before you moved on? Oh. I could look in that record, but I. Uh, oh, just give us a rope. Oh, right. we weren't there in that first one too long because they cut the airstrip out. They were going. They built this airstrip there, and they were flying in an entire division, British division, and they started landing in and bringing them in, and uh, 
when we moved on. We got the call to move on. And the second move was by convoy, and it wasn't very far. And we set up on another airstrip there. And, uh, and then all well, for How two or three you weeks, a couple of weeks. Did you move on by glider again? No, there was the only glider. We moved by air okay. several times, but uh, that was the only glider. And where did you Where go? we went the next time, they could land the plane, see, there was no need for a glider. Well, and where did you go then? We went to, uh, well, we went from, from Zagio is where we landed the first time. Then we went Zagio? To, uh, Zagio was the name of the How do you spell Y-A-Z-A-G-Y-O. Okay. And uh, it was the name of the little village that was there, you know. Mm -hmm. And then the little place called Embong. We was on the river there. I don't spell know. that. Embong. I-M-B-A-U-N-G. Mm -hmm. And there was one thing happened there that I forgot about. There. Oh, tell it. Uh, the village there, they used, uh, the Burmese village, they used uh, water buffalo, domesticated water buffalo to, to uh, plow their uh, rice paddies mm -hmm. and stuff. And they kept them in a, like a wooden stockade. It wasn't too great. And one day there was a wild uh, bull, wild uh, buffalo bull came there. And he was messing around over that stockade. And uh, they, the village, Head man came over to the old man. He was afraid he was going to break that stockade down and they'd lose all their uh, domesticated animals. No. He, he came over and talked to the old man. The old man sent a couple of our guys over there, rifles, and they killed him. And uh, one of the boys from over at Lynn, Indiana, over near Winchester, was a butcher. So he butchered, the, he butchered that water buffalo. And you know, they looked tough, you know, they just. Uh, mm -hmm. And he butchered that buffalo. And we had buffalo steaks that evening. And I don't suppose they'd be that good now, but they tasted pretty good. Uh, <laughs> Real it, tender, I suppose. <laughs> it was, you was know, it, really? it surprised me. I thought, uh, that's what I thought. Man, that'll be tough, and you know it wasn't bad. Uh -huh. And uh, at that same place, one of our Kentucky boys, we had some Kentucky boys, he killed us. The deer over there were small. He killed one of those, and he butchered it, and it was, it wasn't no good. Uh -huh. It was too hot. The weather was too hot. Yeah. Okay, now uh, where, where are we now? We're at the little village of Embalm. Okay. And then we went on them, we flew on them from there into a place called Khan, K-A-N, was the name of this uh -huh. village. They always, a little village near where we yeah. would have an airstrip there. And we spent some time there. And then we went into, the next place was Sinti, S-I-N-T-H-E. It was on a river there. And one thing I remember there, well, it was where I had the gun on the, the ridge. It was a, a plane, there was a plane flew out of the, the big airstrip one late afternoon. And uh, it was an American U.S. Air Force C-46. And he had a loaded, they were African, British African wounded. And he took off and he never, he got off the end of the airstrip and he just got above the trees and he couldn't get her on up. And he swung on, they swung on around to the left and Christ over there in those trees, and we all raced over there and he tore up. I have a, even I have a picture of it. it was, the wings were all gone, the motors were tore off. They were all dead when we got there. And I remember the American crew was when we found them. They were still there. They tore them out, seats and all. They're, they were still strapped in their seats, and they found them laying out there. Uh, all dead though. All of them, everybody was dead. And, you know, I remember that. Well. Uh, are you encountering any enemy as you go along here? Yeah, we had some night, uh, we had some air raids, a couple of air, that was where the air, they came in and they destroyed about six Spitfires that night, and, and uh, we had a couple of raids there. And we the Japanese some, destroyed about six? Yeah, they, they got about, and they killed 30, I think it was 32 British uh, mm -hmm. Air Force personnel. And, uh, Did you get to know the British? Yeah, you know, I, I got to appreciate them because uh, a lot of people, didn't like the British, but we were with them. And we were attached to the British 14th Army, and I, I got to know some of them. And what impressed me more than anything, probably, was some of those fellows had been over there. See, they'd been over there in the British Army before the war, way before the war, and they'd been over there five and six years, and they were going to be there until the war was over. You know, mm -hmm. uh, they didn't hurry up and do anything, but I can see why. They, you know, they'd been there a long time, but they were pretty nice people. Yeah. Did you uh, ever uh, do any socializing with them? Get to 
No. Go out with them or? No, I, I never did do any of that, no. Okay. Of course, I've been there, they wasn't much socializing anyway. Yeah, so I would, you had to do something for yeah. entertainment. Yeah, uh, we, would, we would get up a poker game or something if we could, you know. And, uh -huh. Did you play, play baseball in all these? Not in Burma, no. We did. no. In India, oh yeah. yeah we oh. did softball, especially softball. We had a boy from Attica that was a tremendous softball pitcher. Mm -hmm. Well, okay. Uh, tell us about a little of the action that you saw. Okay, we got we were there at Cynthia, and uh, the British 2nd Division and the 4th Corps was approaching Mandalay. Mandalay's in the, pretty well up in the central center of Burma, and uh, the Irrawaddy River comes right along the south side of Mandalay there, and the British were pushing towards Mandalay, and uh, they had, we had swung over where we were, it was southwest of there, and General Slim, uh, Field Marshal Slim was, was... Did you ever see him? I never did he see him. He was kind of a legendary was, character, yeah, wasn't he? Yeah, and uh, he was the commander of the 14th Army. And he had decided he was going to cut them off. In fact, they went close to where we were there. They they made their own landing bar. He had trees cut down, and they made wooden landing bars because they couldn't get any in there. And the and the Japanese had pulled most of their troops up from the south, intending to annihilate the British Second Division. When they, the Irrawaddy River is a big, wide river, and they intended to annihilate the British Second Division when it came across. Well, he. He cut across behind him and took this town of Petila and had cut off the railroad and the, the hard surface uh, road from Mandalay to Rangoon. He had them cut off, they would see. And they flew us in there then to help hold. We, our job was to hold that airstrip. Mm -hmm. And they had it, when we got in, they had it set up and they had, our perimeter was like the biggest bar bar all around in a trench all around the inside of it. And in the daytime, when we first got there in the daytime, uh, they shelled you. I mean, you know, sometimes pretty heavy, something, but you didn't. Think, and they didn't, they didn't come in in the daytime. But we had air cover up there, and they would fire at us with artillery. And uh, then we would go in. Uh, we would move up. We had our machine guns. We had four right in the corner. We had that set up there, and then we would pull into the. Trench. The trench would be full of troops, I mean British and, and our unit in there. And as soon as it got dark, if it wasn't in your corner, why well, they'd start they'd start coming in. You'd hear them, the guns open up, if it wasn't in your corner, why well, they'd start coming in at night. That's when they attacked. Mm -hmm. and, and, uh, were they infiltrate or they No, they were coming in attacking, see. They they would come uh, in a group, in Oh a, yeah, they'd come in a group and you had to shoot them, boy, because they just kept coming. Uh -huh. Groups of how many? Oh, you'd see a whole platoon maybe coming in up at our corner there, you know. I remember one night we, uh, one of the guys had picked up a pup, a small dog, and made a pet out of it, you know. And there was a, I was sitting there on the yard and, and I saw a, I saw a column out there coming. I had not my field glasses, they, they were, you could use them at night and you could see better with so I alerted the guy. The other guys wasn't on duty, wasn't on guard. Well, I'd be one guy from our squad on guard, and we had a dugout behind here. And the first guy that went on guard in the evening would tie a rope to the next guy's leg. He was laying back here in the dugout, and then when it was two hours up or whatever, he he didn't talk or anything. He'd pull that rope and then wake him up, and then he would get up and tie the rope on mm -hmm. the next guy's leg and come on out and relieve you. See. So well, I got them all up, and we were waiting for him to get up close enough we'd throw grenades on them first, and that little dog started barking. Well, of course, down they went, see. And then we throwed the, we called for some mortars, and they dropped some mortars in there, but they didn't get them quite right, and they got out of there. But that's another thing, I, this fellow had this dog, his squadrator told me later that, of course, that dog alerted him, and the old man said, you will get rid of that dog. And he, the squad leader told this kid, he said, you've got to kill that dog. And he said, well, I can't do that. And he said, what he finally done is he put that dog under a metal bucket or something so he couldn't see him and then shot him through that. Oh, my. But he had to, he had to go because, you know, he, he couldn't have something like that. Yeah. See, that, that 
He was way your position immediately. See, we yeah. don't know. That's right. Well, was that the only uh, time that you saw those Japanese approaching it? No, they every night they would, and, and sometimes wouldn't be. They might not be in our area, but oh. they would be. As soon as it got dark, you could hear. If you didn't see them coming in there, then you'd hear them when guns open up somewhere else around mm -hmm. the camps there. And, uh, How far away were their camps? Did they? Well, they were only all oh, three or four hundred yards out there for uh, their artillery was only out there a short distance. Well, couldn't the American uh, and British air bomb those places out? You'd think they could, but there was a road run out in front of us, three or four hundred yards, and it was lined with trees. And we stepped there one day and watched a squadron of B-25s come over. And they came in low level and they hit, and I'm telling you, you could see nothing but trees and debris going up. You'd think they couldn't live through all that, you know. A little while later, it's it's going to be firing at you. And what they do on their artillery, we would, an, another perimeter behind us was had the British field artillery in it, and we had spotters. And when they'd fire one of their field artillery out there, they spotted would tell them the location on that, and they would they would get their guns set and they would fire over there. And then several times they said, "Well, we we got him because they'd hit the spot they were shooting." They would fire a couple of rounds and then they'd pull that thing out and move it over. Mm -hmm. Move it. And, uh, and then they'd open up. Two months later, yeah. they'd open up again. So. Did you ever uh, uh, come face to face with any Japanese? No, uh, not up close enough to see them. All the deadings is all I you know that were killed. Yeah. You, did, you, did the Americans and the British slaughter a lot of the well, Japanese? There was a lot of them killed there. Now, I was out of there before the end, but they because I was wounded and they evacuated me out. Yeah. But they told me that afterwards they used a bulldozer and cut some ditches and, and just pushed them, pushed them in and covered them up there. Now, uh, how did you have to get wounded? Well, I, I remember that real well. I, we were, uh, what we were done was we would pull everything in. And in a, a daylight, we would, either the British and sometimes us or and the British would go out they would come in and maybe sometimes they'd be outside the perimeter a little way. We'd have to go out and, and contact them and then push them back. And then we'd go out and set our guns up. And they might have a few tanks out there to keep them off. And we'd, they'd still land and our plane was still landing. And the British plane landing with supplies and ammo and uh, uh -huh. and taking out wounded. Well, this particular day, we were, our radio had been shot up. When we had no contact, our our battery headquarters was back at Sentley, which was about 90 miles away. We were running short on supplies and ammo. And the old man told me and the first sergeant, Blair, to see if we could catch a ride back there and get some stuff in there. Well, uh, Lieutenant Scott, who was, in fact, he died the next day, but he took us out there in the Jeep and uh, was a British T-47. And we talked to the pilot and he was hauling the wounded. They were bring the wounded out the hall and they all about all over British. And I we asked him, he said, Oh, he said, I've got a boat. And, and he I said, What the hell's two more? He said, let's mm -hmm. get help us get these guys loaded and we'll get out of here. So we helped them and they was most of them were able to set up. We put them in the bucket seats, you know, with the mm -hmm. head and strap them in. And they had one old Burmese man that had been caught in a crossfire and shot and he had been shot various from barely through here. They mm -hmm. had him bandaged up and they had him on a stretcher and they laid him just on the floor there. I can imagine what was going through that old man's mind. He got shot here, he's shot and he's putting him on an airplane, which is very strange, I'm sure, to him. Yeah. And I as we got everybody loaded, there was one British soldier in the front seat and then there was an empty seat. And I went up there and sat down. I didn't have my shirt on, it was so hot. And Pete uh, first sergeant, he said, I'll just sit here on the floor. I had sat down in that seat and uh, they'd started to fire up one engine and the, the uh, engineer of the crew came out. For some reason, the other one was starting or something. He started back towards the, the rear door and then I was, something knocked me out. Well, what it was, they'd hit, a, they'd, they'd hit that left hand running gear with an artillery shell. The Japanese. Yeah, and uh, it knocked me out, and I don't know, it had to be several minutes because when I came to, there wasn't nobody in the plane but me and this old Burmese man. Because everybody knew that he was going to be hitting it again. They had spotters, and they knew they hit it, and there'd be another round coming mm -hmm. in right away. And 
he was, I can still see him today, he was crawling on his hands and knees heading for that door. And the plane was leaning low, but that door was still pretty high. And he dived out head first. Well, you know, imagine how scared that I was scared, and you can imagine how that old man was. Well, I, I went back, I didn't even know I was wounded. I had no pain. And I, after he dived out, I, I heard the first sergeant come. He'd realized, he, they all went, went over and jumped in some trenches they had dug there. He realized that I hadn't come out of the plane, so he came back hollering for me, and I and then I came out the door. When I jumped down on the ground, I felt pain shoot up this leg, and I'd had a something that hit me there. It wasn't. Uh, it was like a big bruise. That leg got black and blue later, and then I noticed I had blood running all down, blood running clear off my fingers. I'd been hit here in the shoulder, and I had a streak across here. I had no pain. I suppose I was in shock. I don't know. But we raced over and got in a. Trench, Pete put bandage, you know, put give us some salt on there and everything. And there was behind that plane was a British a command plane, a two engine command plane that there had been, I think, four officers, high ranking British officers, had flown in there to see, check the situation out. Well, the second round hit that plane and it just went up in a ball of fire. And those four officers were on that plane. And it just happened that. That night, uh, I was in the, they took me back inside the perimeter and the, the British field hospital was just a, inside the perimeter was just a big, huge hole in the ground. Mm -hmm. and there was a tent over it. And I just happened that I, they brought that pilot into that other plane. And he had, he had shrapnel on his back and, and he told me that when they were about ready to leave, the officers had got on the plane and he hadn't got in yet when they hit us with the first shell. And he, he said, my first thought was, I think maybe I've got time to get on and get out of here. And then he changed his mind and he started running for the trenches and that's when that exploded and that hit him in the Did he kill all those officers? He killed, he killed all those officers. Uh, let's, why don't we take a, a break here. I'm, I'm, I mean, I'm tired too. Then. No, I, 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 I want to get some ideas from these other fellows on things that we haven't covered. Okay. Wounded. Yeah. Right. And let's go on from there. Okay. Well, I they took me. Uh, the British, uh, the British doctors uh, mm -hmm. took this. Well, what it was in my shoulder was it looked like a piece of brass, and I think it something maybe came off of a British. It, 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 of course, it didn't hit the full force or it would have went further in. I mean, it embedded in my shoulder there, and they took that out and dressed it and dressed this thing here. And this was just a big bruise that got black and blue. Then I don't know what hit me there. But they, I was in this uh, uh, British field hospital overnight, and uh, the next morning they they got us out and said we're going to take you over. There's a small evac trip over here, and they used a uh, uh, like a Piper airplane there. L5 is what they were mm -hmm. designated. Uh, they were small two two seat planes, but they they got us up on top and and they loaded us up in a big. It was a British truck, and it was it was setting up in that thing, and they was having a pretty good battle that morning. And it was both was whining and ricocheting. You mean the British were having a battle? I mean the Japanese were attacking the perimeter, and it was oh. was, both were coming, and they were ricocheting around. And I thought, Man, this is a hell of a place to be up here in the air like this. I got out of that truck and sat down on the ground, and get down as low as I could. And about that time, I heard somebody hollering. It was the old man. He got a he commandeered a, was a British vehicle about like what we call a weapons carrier, a small truck. Yeah. And he had Doc Lane, one of the medics, and, and he had an Indian driver. He said, we're going to, Doc Lane's going to take you over to the airstrip. You back there. So we get in, I get in, and we start out, and we leave the perimeter, which worries me a little bit. We leave our perimeter, and we're out there, and well, I consider no man's land, you know. I thought, oh my God, I hope this Indian driver knows where he's going. I didn't have too much confidence. <laughs> We're wandering down through there, and the dust is rolling up behind that truck, and there's dropping shells. They can see that dust, and they're dropping shells behind us. Unfortunately, they're dropping short, and I can just see us driving into a company of Japanese out there. You know that Indian? I had no faith in him at all. But a little bit, we pull up in this little place. There's a grass field there, and there's a, a brick, and been a brick building about half a mile down. And they unloaded me, and I went in. They was there was some other British troops laying there and just laying on stretchers, you know. And we laid there a while and 
after a while, six or eight of these L5 planes landed. They had tanks down on the British tank down in the field to keep the Japanese off. And they first they came walking in. Those pilots they were uh, they were enlisted men. They were sergeant, master sergeant. They weren't commissioned officers flying the plane. They were uh, enlisted mm -hmm. men. And they walked in and they stopped and said, "Well, you're a GI." You know, I said, yeah. He said, "Load him up. He's the first one out of here." <laughs> so the plane they took me out on. They had taken out the, the seat behind the pilot and they. They had so he could raise up the side of the fuselage, and he could, he could hang a stretcher right in there behind the pilot. My head was up next to the pilot yeah. here, and he flew me out. And I went back to they flew me back to my headquarters. Was it Cynthia? Cynthia. Uh, and uh, Air Force uh, Air Force doctor there uh, treated my wounds and, and gave three bandages. I spent the night there. And the next morning, then I went. They took me over to the big airstrip, and they flew me out in a uh, either C-46 or C-47 back to India to a, a station hospital, but right near where we left from when mm -hmm. we flew out of there. And I spent I spent two months. I was in the hospital two months, and uh, then I got released. Uh, the old man came in to see us, and my brother my brother was in the 20th Air Force, and they came through India. On their way to China, and then they, after they went to China, then they went on to South Pacific. But they were in Calcutta on their way over to China, and I, we had a code set up where we could tell where we were at. And I knew he was in Calcutta, and the old man came in, and I told him I got a brother down in Calcutta. And he said, "Well, when you get when you get discharged from the hospital, just take two or three days without seeing him." Well, he left about two days before I um. before I uh, got released, and then. The, I didn't know where the outfit was. It was kind of on your own. I, and I, so I knew we had a supply sergeant at a place called Chittagong, over in, almost in the Burma. So I got a plane, a coat plane over there, and I looked this sergeant up, and he said, well, they're in Rangoon already. Now, I, I was surprised they were that far down. And he said, I got a, I got a plane of supplies and mail going in the day after tomorrow. You he mean said, you were talking about your own outfit? Yeah. And, down in Rangoon. And he said, I got supplies and the mail. And mail going down to him in a couple of days, so I got a billet and and, uh, and I went out there that morning to get on the plane. One of our other guys, I don't know where he was coming from, walked out there and, and started to get on that plane. They were putting fuel in C-47. He looked at that, and he looked that number, and he said, he said that's the same one I flew out of here about three days ago, and, and the engine went out on, and they had to throw everything out and come back. And you know, we'd never had a parachute when we flew. So but I asked them guys how long they were going to be fueling that plane. And, oh, it was going to be a while. We went over to all the, the all, say, the, where the tower thing, you know, and I asked them where I could get a parachute. <laughs> so we got, we both checked out parachute. They didn't have any trouble when they flew into the yeah. again. And they were, they were there and uh, they were. Your own outfit. Yeah, I got back to my own outfit and they were in a, staying in a three building, three story building there. It had been a small university. And they were staying there, the whole battalion was in there then. And being a lot of Indiana guys, we we got the notion across the street had been a gymnasium. And started playing basketball. And it had a wooden floor, but it had, had been used as a stable. And it was caked with dried cow manure. Well, we dug all that off, dug it clear down to that wood, and washed it all down. And we played basketball in that old gymnasium. <laughs> Yeah, As you played basketball in high school? Yeah, yeah, uh -huh. oh yeah. And uh, so we stayed there several weeks and uh, we got on another ship and came back to Calcutta and uh, we went to a camp there and uh, they finally decided they were going to break the outfit up. They didn't, they didn't want no use anymore, which they did. And we was, uh, they offered me a, a job and a replacement company there with the processing troops coming and going. They said they told me they'd get some more stripes, you know, but and I got to thinking, you know, that was in like uh, July of forty five. We didn't know the war was that close to being over. Yeah. And I thought, man, you processing troops coming and going, you're gonna be one of the last suckers out of here. I said, I don't whether I want that or not. And they came they came uh, Said they was having a meeting over at the theater, and they was wanting some volunteers. So I went over, and they 
I didn't even know what it was, but they said they had a, they were going to train, fix some people, and they were going to train them for a mission that would, once the training was over, the last four months, and then we'd go home. And that sounded pretty good to me, because I'd been there quite a while. And so, I, I volunteered, and they didn't take everybody. They checked you out pretty close, and they didn't take some of them. Some of us went on, and they us down to Salon, to Sri Lanka now. Uh -huh. Beautiful island, beautiful island. And we landed there one evening at the Colombo Salon. They picked us up, took us down to the camp at a place called Gall, G-A-L-L-E. It was on a hill overlooking the bay, beautiful spot there. They took us in and said, now throw your baggage in there and come on over to the chow. We were having chow out of there. So we went over and walked in. I thought it was in the wrong place because they had tables for four with tablecloths on the tables, you know. And I said, we must be in the officer's mess or something. <laughs> and they said, no, no. And they had waiters, you know, and you'd have soup. And, boy, this was great, you know. Finger bowl. No, not quite that much. <laughs> uh, it was the OSS is what it was. And we started training then, and we uh, got small arm training there on I think nine different weapons, uh, British, French, uh, our own, and it was a, it was a chief petty officer in the Navy uh, was the arm instructor there. They was people there from all groups of the service, yeah, and, and civilian, uh, Siamese natives were there, and uh, we, we trained there for quite a while, and then we shipped across the island to uh, Trinco Malay, it was a big, British naval base on the northeast corner of that island. I won't ask you to spell that. It, I couldn't do it, I don't think. <laughs> but we were there for jungle survival training and parachute uh, training and uh, went into that and then the war ended. Yeah. Right. Who was your boss? Uh, in that outfit, I can't remember who it was. Uh, we were grouped in, I remember we were grouped in squads of four and there was two commissioned officers and two enlisted men. Were any of those uh, Fellows that you've been with up above there, uh, still with they, you? Yeah, there was a few. There was a handful of us went in, uh -huh. and uh, one of them and I stayed together all the way through, but the others I didn't. And then the war ended, and uh, General Wheeler, I think, was the American commander then, and uh, he called. He wanted to. He wanted to go to Bangkok. He was going into Bangkok to accept the Japanese surrender. They were ready for surrender. Yeah. And he asked for 100 OSS men. Well, they picked out, I noticed they picked out the tallest men uh -huh. because the Japanese are smaller. You know? yeah. <laughs> and they, they gave us new equipment, new uniform, new equipment, new rifles, uh, sidearms, and we started doing close order. We hadn't done that for years, and we started doing that. We were going to go in first to make sure that it was safe for him to come in. Yeah. We had classes, we had a, it was a colonel. Full Colonel, he was, he was, a, he lived in Siam, he was a native, well, it's Thailand now, he lived in Bangkok, but he, he held the rank of Major, but he was in this OSS, and we had classes, and he would show us landmarks in Bangkok, in case something happened, it was, they was going to pick us up at a certain point if we could get there, they were preparing us in case they were hostile when we got in there, yeah. but, uh, we were going through all this, and Lord Mountain Batten heard about this, and he, put, he immediately put a stop to it. He said, we don't go to them to surrender. They come to me to surrender. So he made the Japanese commanders come to Rangoon and surrender. So, it, uh, so I didn't go. I want to go, but I, you know, just for the heck of it, but yeah. I, didn't, I didn't get to. Did you, uh, you ever see Mount Batten? Yeah. I saw him and, uh, when we were there in Rangoon, and they had a victory parade. And uh, like I say, we didn't get to march in it. And then... Uh, of course, he was reviewing it, the parade down there that day, and then we came back to our quarters there, and we were standing out there, and he went by in a command car, uh -huh. top down, you know. He was a nice man. He was a well-liked man. Yeah. Uh, I I mentioned uh, Colonel Hellwell. Mm -hmm. Did you ever get to see him? No, I didn't. Uh, what was his uh, What was his position in? Well, you know, I don't know for sure on that part was because we just trained and they had they called them detachment. We was in detachment 505 and uh, we had different officers and I don't remember what he was. Yeah. He had, the reason I asked, he'd been my boss when I was in, oh, one of my bosses yeah. when I was in Tehran and then he went over to Cairo and from Cairo he went over to, uh, to the China River, India. And I, I was just uh, 
for me, it's, uh, I remember him, mean, he'd been a lawyer in Miami Beach, and uh, uh, after the war, uh, I read about him, and, but uh, very interesting. Uh, now, the only topic. other thing I can is, uh, then we, the war, of course, ended, and uh, we were waiting then to get our orders to head out, finally mm -hmm. did, we flew back, it flew us back to India. Tell us about that, uh, about that surrender ceremony. Were you there? No, I, I didn't get to uh, see that. But uh -huh. I, I was wanting to go in the bank office to be doing something like that, you know. But Lord Bowden that and took first off of that. No, I, we didn't see that. We were already back in India by the time they got that done. Uh -huh. And uh, we went back to India and, uh, on this air, on this base, and waiting for our orders. And, and we, we, we knew when the ships were coming in from the States, you know, yeah. and they would leave. And I was in a tent with six, four, five other men, and they had, you were on a point system. I mean, you got so many yeah. points for a month in the service and overseas, and yeah. five points for decorating. And these, some of these guys had way more points than I did, and, and uh, they had pulled them out, the, the men with points, they pulled them out of their unit and replaced them with men from the States. Mm -hmm. And they came down, they were beginning to realize, then after they came down there, to go home, their, their unit was getting orders to go home as a unit. Well, these guys had come over from the States two or three weeks ago, were going home with the unit, and these guys were still sitting there. Yeah. So they went down, to, a bunch of them went down to Calcutta, the Inspector General, and raised the deadline. The day we got on the boat, we got a hurry up order to, to get on the trucks. And as we went down on the convoy, there was a convoy coming up, and, and the, the boat had been loaded with troops. And uh, they went down there and they took every man off that didn't have enough points to go home. And they, that's what was coming back, was a convoy mm -hmm. coming back, and we got on the boat and came home. And one was talking about running into that boat out there. We went from Calcutta to Colombo, back to the salon again. Mm -hmm. And we pulled in there, and I suppose if you look, we pulled out there in the evening. It was still daylight. And uh, pulled out in the Indian Ocean, and I could still remember, just like a mirror. Never seen it like that before. It wasn't that way right on. It was just as smooth as it could be. We're setting up on the right hand side with a rail and it's American uh, Navy transport, pretty good sized ship. Here's this British ship coming. We're going like this, and he's coming like this. I mean, you can see that if somebody didn't turn directly, we're going to hit. And nobody turned, and we got back away from him directly. I am. He ran right into the side of us. Broad daylight. Mm -hmm. and, uh, they got on them blankers, looked like they cussing one another out, you know. It, his bow was up. His bow punched a small hole in the mm -hmm. side of our ship, but they didn't even slow down. They, re, they repaired it. But I, I couldn't believe that somebody on one bridge or the other wouldn't see them. Yeah. They wouldn't see them. And that, from then it was a ride home across the same way we went. Yeah. We came through the Suez Canal at night. Well, you home. came back uh, the same, same way. way. Yeah, I was hoping to go the other way, but a few of the guys did, but I, I didn't get there. <laughs> but we went through the Suez at night. I remember we stopped just before we got in there, and they mounted floodlights on the side of the ship, and we went through there at night. Did you stay on the same ship all the way back? Yeah. You did, you, did you stop along the line of? I think it took 26 days, 26 days from Calcutta. Is that an American ship? Yeah, it was U.S. transport, Navy transport. Uh, Liberty ship? Uh, it was bigger than the Liberty ship. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know what class it was, but it was bigger. Yeah. And uh, I remember <laughs> we got started and they asked for volunteers to do KP and stuff. And I, I, you know, I didn't volunteer for nothing until we got down to the, where they was signing me stuff. Well, they signed me and another fellow night KP. <laughs> so we went down, they had Navy cooked, and we eat real good on that boat. We went down and we go down at night. It worked out pretty good because uh, we would report, when we reported in the evening, the day KPs had cleaned up from the supper, the dinner, and everything was cleaned up. And the only thing we had to do that night, we, I remember one time they were going to have scrambled eggs for breakfast. And they brought those cases of eggs out, and they had, I don't know how many of us sitting around there, and we had huge or stainless steel tubs, and you take two eggs in each hand and you crack them and, yeah. and you get the eggs ready for the morning. And I, I remember once in a while a shell would go in there or maybe a bloody egg would go in there and you'd start to sing that out and that 
they would come and say, oh, hell, don't worry about that. So I'm get all that mixed up, they wouldn't know the <laughs> And they'd say, well, out and want to. And they had a bakery down there where they made rolls and stuff. And if you want to get you a steak out of the freezer there, why well, fry you have a steak. And then when it came morning, while well, the day cake bees would come down and take over. So the only thing we had to do was maybe pull some meat out of the freezer. So it was a pretty good deal. We got to sleep in the daytime. Yeah. <laughs> it was pretty good. I didn't think that they, uh, by that time, uh, the corporals would be doing cake bees. Well, everybody. They give everybody. They want yeah. somebody doing something, you know, because yeah. that's monotonous. Yeah. That's 26 days on the road. I always found that my name beginning with W was always a big help. Yeah. Because they never got to the W's. <laughs> Fellows with the A's and the B's <laughs> got the KP. Uh, well, uh, you got home, where did you go? Well, I was in the OSS. Yeah. And we reported, had to report to Washington. And we came into New York Harbor. I, you know, that's another thing I remember. We, The first thing we saw, we, it was still dark as we were coming approaching New York City, but you could first thing you see the lights on the mm -hmm. horizon, you know. And uh, then by the time we got in and came up the river, past the Statue of Liberty, it was, it was daylight, you know. I still remember that, boy, that yeah. was... That, that was thrill. Yeah, tears in your eyes. Yeah. And then we came up, and <clears throat> that was on Friday, and they picked us up, <clears throat> took us out to Fort Hamilton, right out there on the island. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, took some barracks there and said, now throw your stuff in there, and they called us out and they said, now we're, you're going, the train leaves for Washington on Monday morning, if you want to go be here. From now, from now to land, you're on your own. So, you know, we went around, we hit a few bars, and, but uh, Monday morning uh, we went to Washington and uh, they put us up in the Congressional Country Club. The OSS had the Congressional Country Club there, and that's where we were housed. Oh, pretty fancy. And, uh, I remember we were there over Thanksgiving, and they were having, of course, their regular Thanksgiving meal, and well, me and my buddy that had been with me all the time, I said, let's get away from this. So we went, I remember we went into ball, or into Washington, and uh, in the restaurant there, and they had oysters, you know, fried oysters, and I loved those. I'd never seen anything off my oysters. They had half orders of full orders. I, I, I loved oysters, and I said, well, give me a full order. And I'll tell you, when they brought that out, it was a stack of oysters like you've never seen, and I couldn't hardly eat them. But we spent a few days there. They had to. We were on detached service from the Army. When we went in the OSS, it was detached service. Yeah. So then they had to reinstate us back in the Army before they discharged us. Mm -hmm. So then they sent us, to, after they got all that processed, why we went to Fort Belvoir, Virginia, where I got my discharge. Yeah. And then they gave us a take it on a train. We left Washington the one evening and we got in Indianapolis the next morning on the train. Did you, uh, what about your communication with the folks back home? Did you, did you write on a regular basis and did you get, uh, how'd your mail come through? Well, the first four months, you see, we went from the States, we left in October and we didn't get to end it until February. Mm -hmm. And the only thing I got, or well, any of us got, was a couple of little email letters because our mail went on to our destination. So yeah. mm -hmm. We got there, they had bags and bags and bags of mail, but we went about four months without any, without any Did reason. you write yourself? Did you have a regular time every day to write? I, no, not every day. There's times when you just couldn't. Mm -hmm. And uh, I would, I tried to do it on a regular basis, you know, mm -hmm. but with my Communicate with your, did you have a girlfriend back home or did uh, just your a couple of my here, you, uh, you were present when they freed some American POWs. No, I'm oh. sorry, I wasn't present. I was, oh. I was wounded, I was in the hospital in India, but I I know about it and it's in the record and I talked okay. to the guys, but it was north of Rangoon, uh, not too many miles, and our unit was in, they had been on an airstrip there and the rains, had, the monsoon rains had started and they had to pull off the airstrip and they pulled into a little village there. And the Japanese were bringing, they were marching prisoners of war north out of Rangoon in order to get them around the bay there to get them into Thailand. And they underestimated the speed in which the British 14th Army was moving south and they realized that they were trapped and they couldn't get out of there. So they, unfortunately, they let the prisoner of war go. Sometimes you, they might have just killed them, you know. Mm -hmm. But, of course, they started walking north and they didn't have shoes. Most of them didn't even have any shoes there walking barefoot. And our commanding officer, as I understand, was a colonel. 
he was leading them up through there, and the, act, the day after that the Japanese had, had let them go, uh, some of our planes, now I don't know whether they were British or American, flew over and thought they were Japanese troops and straight them. They killed this colonel. Oh my. Unfortunately. And then they worked their way up, and they got to this airfield, and, and it was at night, and they were afraid to come in that village. And they stayed out there in that wet and laid out there. And our guys went out the next day and realized that they were, of all the troops that they ran into, we were the only American ground troops in southern Burma, and they ran into our troops there, and they were overjoyed to see uh, GIs, you yeah. know, and they, like I say, they had no shoes. They scrounged up shoes for all of them and clothes, and, and they almost overfed them because they were almost starved to death, you know. Yeah. And they were given anything they wanted to eat, and one of the medics said, hold on guys, you know, I will kill these guys. Yeah. So then they then they flew, uh, as soon as the airstrip was uh, usable, well, they yeah. flew in the uh, evac planes and threw them out of there. But some of those fellows had been, they were all Air Force personnel, Air Force crews, and they, some of them had been prisoners for a long time. Yeah. Well, did, uh, I think I asked you earlier, did you ever see Stillwell? No, I never did see mm -hmm. General mm -hmm. Manager Joe. Uh -huh. Yeah. So what was his reputation over there? What kind of cantankerous type uh -huh. guy, yeah. Uh, uh -huh. hard to get along with. Uh -huh. But he used to, he handled mostly the Chinese troops up there. It was what yeah. he was handling. Mm -hmm. But uh, now we've got you back to the States. Uh, I think uh, uh, just Tell us, uh, you were discharged, and when were you discharged? I was discharged in Fort Belvoir, Virginia, in uh, November of '45. And uh, you came back uh, by train? I came back by train to Indianapolis. And, and, uh, the family meet you there? I had an aunt living in Indianapolis, and I went out to her house <coughs> and uh, contacted my folks at home, and a cousin of mine, Debbie Hilbert, came over and, uh -huh. and brought me back, back to Lawless. And uh, what did you do after the war? Well, for a short period of time, I I lived there with my grandmother, and we did a little farming there. And I worked for uh, for a couple of months. I went in the construction bin. We was doing the mm -hmm. construction work, and I knew I didn't want to do that. And I thought about going to school. And then uh, one of my buddies from down there had been in the Navy during the war. Him and I were good friends, and he got discharged shortly after I did. And, and we were, he went to school. He went over to Illinois and went to school, but he had worked at Donnelly's before the war. And one day he was coming back up here to discuss whether he might go back to work or not with them. And he said, come on right up with me. So I came up and I didn't even know what Donnelly was at that time. And I went in and they were hiring anybody and everybody at that time. And I filled out an application and they called me right away. And I went to work and I, worked, I spent 41 years up there. 41 years at Donnelly's. What, uh, what was your job? Well, I, my first job was working in the old plate making foundry, the hot metal foundry out there in Department A. And I worked there several years. And then they, they phased that out. They don't do that type of stuff anymore. And then I, I went into CMP as an uh -huh. And then I went up to a, a copy analyst. I ended up as a copy analyst. I analyzed a customer's copy when it comes in for a book, I yeah. analyze it. Process. When did you retire? In 1987. And uh, you got married somewhere along the line. Yeah, I got married in 1946. Who's May of 1946. Who, 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 who was your wife? Lillian Shade from Hillsborough. S-H-E-A? S-H-A-D-E. Oh, Shade. Uh -huh. Okay. Do you have any children? We have two sons. Uh, Gary Michael, he's about 40. One now he lives in Denver, Colorado. He graduated from Crawfordville High School, but he, he lives in Denver. And then Keith Allen lives up on uh, Wayne Down Road. He's still in the house up there. He worked for Ray Tech. For Ray Tech. Ray Tech. Uh -huh. Okay. And they have they each have two children. Uh, Gary Michael Denver has two sons, and Keith has a son and a daughter. Mm -hmm. Now, but, uh, since you've been out of the service and going to any reunions? I go to my reunion every year. Where, uh, tell us about those every reunions. Reunion. Well, basically our unit was comprised of Midwestern boys, Ohio, Kentucky, and Indiana. So we really set, well, we set it up in Madison, Indiana, which is 
pretty well centrally located between all of them. And we set up on Labor Day weekend because everybody's working that give them a three day weekend to come there. And we just we just kept going there ever since once a year. That started about 1949. You're up at then it's been meeting for a long time. Yeah, yes. Uh, uh, how many of you are there left that go to these reunions? Well, you know, surprisingly, out of the 85 men and five officers, there's about there's about 50 of them still surviving. There. And do they all go to the reunion? Uh, the ones that are able to, and there's a few we never did locate after the war. And I, in fact, I still locate one. Well, our medic from Doc Lane, we call him Doc, uh, lived in Massachusetts, and I've hunted for years to try to find him. And I located him in San Diego, California. If you're, well, he flies in every two years. He doesn't come every year, but he yeah. flies in every two years. And, and, uh, Have your wives and families got to know each other? Yeah, yeah, and the grandkids, our kids and grandkids, mm -hmm. and, uh, they're no longer come, but they did at one time, the kids came. Yeah. And uh, just good friends, I mean, we were pretty good friends in service, and now real good friends. You ever been president of the outfit? Oh yeah. And, Have you? And, and, <laughs> that's kind of a job, I yeah. expect, isn't it? You know, we were. The reason I got all those records was uh, this battery, this sister battery of ours, that's trained in Georgia, went over there with us. They have, they have one too, and we usually talk to them, and they had a unit history made up. And we were sitting there looking at it one day, and. A buddy of mine from Cincinnati, John DeAndros, we call him Dago. Uh, said, Davy, you ought to make up a history of ours. They called me Davy. I said, I, we can remember all them dates. So that's when I started researching and found out all that stuff's on microfilm, all those records. Yeah. It's, uh, so I, I started researching that. I worked on that for several years. In the meantime, trying to locate the fellows that had been Well, one of my boys in my squad was from. Eastern Kentucky, down in that rough part of Kentucky, you know. Yeah. Dan Lynch. Um, Corbin, Kentucky, and down there. in there, and uh, so I, I tried to locate him after the war, and my wife and I were over there, and we drove down through Eastern Kentucky. <laughs> we were riding out there one day, and, and this little town where he was from, and I can't remember the name of it now. And I said, we've had to pass that town, and we went on down, and it was out in the middle of the country, and a little curve, and there's a filling station. Guy who washed his pickup truck out there. And I thought, and I said, Can you tell me where, whatever this town was? And he, he said, Yep, it's down the road 10 miles. He didn't say down the road that way or down the road this way. And I said, <laughs> I said, You mean down that way? He said, Yep. Uh, boy, he wouldn't give me the time of day. So I went back and we went down that. There two, two or three little houses down in there, a, a little old country store, and I went in and a lady was around that store and there's two or three guys sitting around. And I told her I was looking for William Daniel Lance that used to live here. They remembered the name and said there's nobody around here with that name anymore. So I gave up and, and one year my wife and I took off on a weekend and didn't know where we were going. And we ended up in Lexington, Kentucky at a holiday inn. And, and whenever I get somewhere around where some of the guys might have come from, I'll look in the phone book. I, that day I looked in the phone book and there was a William Lee Lynch in there. And I said, my God, that couldn't be him. I called and it was him. <laughs> and uh, he said, where are you at? And I said, I'll call him in. He said, I'll be right over. He came on. He came out of the service about the time we did and stayed out about a year. And then he re-enlisted in the Air Force. Spent 23 years, I think it was, total. And, yeah. and uh, he was settled to death. And he comes every year now. Uh -huh. Well, Jim, uh, get out your medals here and let's, okay. uh, let's, let's look at them. I don't know whether that will show up on the uh, camera or not. Will it, uh, Ed? Uh, can you point those out? Uh, okay. This is the Purple Heart, of course. That's for the time that's, you got splattered. That's, that's for the wounds, yeah. And this is a good conduct medal, which I suppose almost everyone got. Yeah. This is the Asiatic Pacific Theater campaign uh, ribbon with two campaign or battle stars on there. And that's the World War II victory medal there. This is our CBI pack, yeah. which you wore on the left shoulder. I'm familiar and with this that. Is our unit. That's our unit patch there. Okay. And then I have There's a, your dog tag now. I, yeah, I got one of the dog tags. In there. Okay. I had them laying around and I thought, well, why not? And my oldest grandson, he's, he's spoken to this now. I'm done with it, so I'm going to let him have it. Yeah. You ever sit around and tell your grandkids about all this? 
Yeah, they like to listen to that. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, we sat around at a reunion and tell tall tales too, as you can imagine. You know? Oh, that's uh, yeah. what you do. Uh, we took those for, we had one fellow from Louisville that uh, shortly after our reunion four years ago had a stroke and it late, it late from that time until the last September, like a vegetable, and then he finally, um, thankfully, passed on. But six of us went down and were Paul Bears for his funeral. My family really appreciated that. We've been close friends for all the yeah. years. Where, where's your uh, reunion going to be this year? In Madison, Indiana. Madison, uh, Indiana. Mm -hmm. Labor Day weekend. Oh. Well, I I think this has been fascinating. Well, I, yeah, I, I appreciate sure do Thank you. appreciate you coming here. And I hope uh, maybe your great grandkids can hear this tape. Uh, and yeah, I hope they'll, so too. they'll enjoy it. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Okay. Thanks again uh, for coming. I, I, oh, let, let me, uh, I want to point out something here. You know, we've got a couple of people here that have been helping us on this. Mm -hmm. and, uh, our, our, our cameraman there is uh, Ed Miller. He's been representing the Veterans of Foreign Wars. He's been doing that. And Claire Chamberlain over here. Yeah, I know Claire really well. Is, uh, Everybody knows the Legion. Yeah. yeah. And uh, he, Claire has been coordinating this thing and getting you fellows together. Well, I'm sure. I'm glad I can help I want to express our appreciation to them. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thanks a lot.